reading from Matthew chapter 5. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The meditations we will be using for Lent during this Lenten season focus on the Beatitudes, and in particular, I am going to be using some of Richard Rohr's meditations as the basis for our evening messages. Jesus was a remarkable teacher who followed the instructional style of the wisdom tradition. If you remember, the wisdom tradition is found in some Old Testament books like Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. Those are books that mark the wisdom tradition. Theologian Henry Nouwen often said this type of teaching and communication recognizes that deep truth is true everywhere. And indeed, when we look at the Beatitudes, we discover that Jesus' universal wisdom, especially as articulated in the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, resonates with even those who are not Christians. In fact, just as an example, Gandhi was very influenced by Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. The wisdom tradition is something that resonates at the non-dualistic or holistic level. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount helps us to discover this. His Sermon on the Mount is the very blueprint for the Christian lifestyle. And most scholars see it as the best summary of all of Jesus' teaching. But we cannot understand this wisdom with the rational, dualistic mindset where we tend to think and look of things and look at things as either or, black or white, and right or wrong. If we do, we will largely misunderstand it while convinced that we got it on the first try. You see, Jesus taught an alternative wisdom, the reign of God which overturns the conventional and common trust in power, possessions, and personal prestige. To understand the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, we must approach it with an open heart and a beginner's mind. We must be ready to have our normal cultural beliefs and preferences changed. And quite honestly, throughout history, most people have been unable to do this because they have tried to fit the gospel into their already pre-existing cultural agenda. The Gospel of Matthew sets the stage for the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus sees the crowds following him and heads to the mountain, which, by the way, is symbolic for the new Moses and the giving of a new law. He heads there with his disciples, And this is his opening line, which is central to his entire message. It is the key to everything else. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed is a word that we need to think about. Being blessed is not the same as simply being happy or having an abundance of good things in life. What Jesus is teaching us is something about God. He is describing what is important to God and what life is like in the kingdom of God. With the word blessed, Jesus is signaling, as did the prophet Isaiah before him, that this is something God cares about. This is something God commends. When Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, it is not so much an evaluation that poverty is good as it is an invitation to shift our own perspective on what we might consider a blessing. We are invited to participate in God's transformation of the world. So looked at in this way, Jesus is saying, this is what God commends, our alliance with the poor, 
the meek, the peacemaker, and the persecuted. The good news and blessing Jesus announces is that we are invited into a new way of joining with God in creating the kind of world God wants everyone to inhabit. Jesus says, blessed are the poor. Richard Rohr suggests poor in spirit means an inner emptiness and humility, a beginner's mind. It means to live without a need for personal righteousness or reputation. It is what some might call the powerlessness of Alcoholics Anonymous first step when one says, I cannot do this by myself on my own power. The Greek word Matthew uses for poor literally means the very empty ones, those who are crouching over. They are the bent over beggars, the little nobodies of this world who have nothing left, who are not self-preoccupied or full of themselves in any way. Jesus is saying God commands this when you have an inner emptiness and humility, when you are not self-preoccupied, self-absorbed, or full of yourself, because then you are the freest of all. You see, the poor in spirit don't have to play any competitive games. They are not preoccupied with winning which is the primary philosophy in the United States today. Jesus is recommending a social reordering, quite different from common practice. Notice also he uses present tense. He says the kingdom of God is theirs. He does not say will be theirs. This tells us that God's reign isn't later. It is right now. And you are only free, when we understand this, you are only free when you have nothing to protect and nothing you need to prove or defend. Then the kingdom of God is yours. When we come to God empty-handed, placing our total trust in God, then we are set free to truly live a life that matters. Then we are set free to live lives for others, all others, and not ourselves. This is when we truly receive the greatest gift and the greatest rewards in life. When we come to God empty-handed, placing our trust totally in God, we are then set free to truly live into the reign of God. Amen.